1. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones. Uh huh. From here and out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel. One man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder. According to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you. When your children act in a time that comes, what do these stones mean? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant when it crossed over the Jordan. And the waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be a memorial for the children of Israel forever. These stones shall be a memorial for the children of Israel forever. Very quickly, 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. I'm going to marry these two together. 1 Kings chapter 22. Hallelujah. Glory. First Kings chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22. Now I want to look at verses 4 through 7. And then I'll, I'll just flow from there. Okay? First Kings chapter 22. These are both not familiar passages, but stay with me. Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people. My horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it, into the hand of the king. Verse number seven. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there still not a prophet of the Lord there? Is there still not a prophet of the Lord there? That we may inquire of him. In other words, he's asking, is there a word from the Lord? And I want to look at the response of verse number 8. And I'm going to close with this. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, 1 Kings 22 and 8, There is still one man named Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me. Is there a word from the Lord? Is there not a prophet with a word from the Lord? I want to talk about for a few moments this morning from the subject, where have all the prophets gone? Where have all the prophets gone? Where have all the prophets gone? We we'll need to pray in church this morning. Where have all the prophets gone?
Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, saints and friends, we are at the threshold of a new day. While there is a polarizing moment that we are living in, there are times when I minister, that I minister on Sunday morning to the global flock. There are times in which I minister to the world online and allow the global flock to listen. And then there are times when I speak broadly to the body of Christ. And in this moment, I believe we're at some of all three. But I have a word from God, not just connected to us that are tied to our mantle, our ministry, but also to the body of Christ at large. And I want to speak prophetically as the Spirit of God has really been ministering to me over the last few days and even this weekend. I spent about three hours in the presence of God this week. And I had no idea all of these transitions were happening. Something is happening. And we have to be able to pause and stand still enough to recognize it. I remember, I, I love and I happen to enjoy so many television programs now with my daughter. And, and I'll sit and watch different things that I haven't watched since I was, when I was little, or stuff that didn't exist when I was little that she enjoyed. Because every generation is different. And sometimes we'll sit together and we'll watch classics like Barney. Uh, and then now, uh, they had Veggie Tales. And I mean, by the time they had Veggie Tales, when I was coming along, I was too old for it. Uh, and then they also now have Paw Patrol. And so we'll watch these things together. And what ends up happening uh, is that she'll watch and we'll watch She'll laugh and I'll laugh. But there's always a message, a thought, an insight that will come as we watch these particular things. And a couple of days ago, we were watching an episode of Barney and they were trying to figure out how they were going to go to another land. They were in one place and they were trying to figure out how they could go. And, and they looked over and they said, uh, uh, we, we can get there, but we have to use our imagination. We can't Get where we're trying to go. I'm going somewhere, trust me. Unless we use our imagination. And as I was thinking about that, I thought about the cultural moment that we are in. The polarizing society that we are in. The polarizing political climate that we are in. Especially in the Western Hemisphere, especially the tension racially. Ethnically, politically, socially, psychologically, emotionally. You can cut the tension with a knife or you even need something bigger, maybe a sledgehammer, to cut the tension that we're experiencing right now. And I was fascinated by how this weekend, major leaders in our community, in the civil rights community, and even major leaders in the body of Christ because what we don't hear about in our modern day understanding of the civil rights movement is that 50 years ago that it was predominantly raised up by the people of God in the church. And all of those voices that we now revere were churchmen and they were trained in the church. Amen. Amen. When we look at Representative uh, John Lewis, who went on to be the Lord this weekend, and Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, C.T. Vivian, they were trained in seminary, they were trained to understand scripture, to understand doctrine, to understand theology, and out of their understanding of theology, they began to understand the sociological dynamic that affects the people of God who are sojourners or pilgrims in this weary land. I wish you would talk to me. Yes. yes. It was out of that theological construct, stay with me, it was out of that theological construct that a sociological, psychological, economical, and even an emotional ability to realize the time period began to come. And I was baffled, and I have been baffled by how a week ago, in the Pentecostal charismatic community, there was a transition of Morris Sorello, a great man of God that traveled uh, and did lots of miracles. I want you to notice something. He did lots of miracles. God used him. He went to places in Africa and other nations that nobody would go preach to. And miracles would break out. It was known that when he would go and arrive, there would be witch doctors and witches that would pray 
for, years, for hours and days before he came because they knew that if he showed up to the territory, their power would be broken. I first heard him preach in person, uh, speak in person when I was at Thousand Rose Funeral. And I, 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 I began to see the kingdom of God at work in action. I submit to you even this, this morning that many of the transitions we have seen over the last few days, those were men of God that I, I wish I could be like when I grew up. I remember uh, in Bahamas at Thousand Rose Funeral, uh, they had asked Mar Sorello to get up and he was in his 80s when he died. And when he got up, you saw an old feeble man that they had to help get to the podium. But when the mic came in his hand, it was as if the power of God ran through the place. I remember the power of God hit so strongly when he was talking, I almost jumped back. So you see the transition last week of Morris Sorello, then this weekend with Dr. Vivian, and then again with Congressman Lewis, and then on the same day, the next day, yesterday, we see the transition of J.I. Packer who wrote the book, Knowing God. So we see a transition of one in the charismatic Pentecostal stream, two in the social justice civil rights stream, and then one that has been one that has been known in white evangelicalism. What am I saying? All of the streams that have been colliding and fighting right now all lost some. Come on. There is something to be said if we have an ear to hear and we can hear the sound of the wind. The wind is blowing. And I remember watching with my daughter. Glory to God. I remember watching, sitting down with Barney and said, so we can get there if we can imagine. They look over and BJ would look back at Barney and say, imagine, imagine, imagine. And I heard Walter Brueggemann in his book, The Prophetic Imagination. Yes. He said the prophet engages in futuring fantasy. The prophet does not ask if the vision can be implemented. For questions of implementation are of no consequence until the vision can be imagined. Questions of implementation are of no consequence until the vision can be imagined. Then he says, the imagination must come before the implementation. That's why when we heard about a, a, a man standing up in 1963 and said, I have a dream. It was not a vision that would be fulfilled in his lifetime. It was a dream that would fill us with an imagination of what could be possible. That is what happens when you have been captured by a prophetic spirit. Stay with me. So the imagination, Ruben said, must come before the implementation. And he said these words, and I want you to hear it. Our culture is competent to implement almost anything and to imagine almost nothing. Wow. Our culture is competent to implement almost anything, but to imagine almost nothing. And so his argument was, it is the vocation of the prophet to keep alive the ministry of imagination. I'm going to say it again. It is the vocation of the prophet to keep alive the ministry of imagination. It is the vocation of the prophet to keep alive the ministry of imagination. Therefore, we as the people of God who are led by a prophetic spirit must be the ones to reimagine what we see in front of us. So when we see injustice, we have to reimagine justice according to the kingdom of God. Reimagine the imagination has been so wired in us as the people of God that Jesus said, when you pray, you pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, be your name. Then what? Thy kingdom come. How? Thy will be done. Where? On earth. As it is in heaven. On earth, realistically, it looks bad. It looks chaotic. You don't need a news handle. Just walk outside. 
sign. It looks crazy. You don't need CNN to tell you, but you need a prophet to be able to look in the midst of the darkness and still keep hope alive. So uh, he says, when you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That takes supernatural imagination to begin to believe. As God begins to release his spirit to reshape and reset the trajectory of our time. I hope you're hearing me this morning. My Lord. So, first of all, we look in the book of Joshua. Chapter number four. I'm just going to flow the way I feel the Lord. Hello. Lord. Chapter number four. And in chapter four, they have just begun the process of crossing over. Oh my God. And in the middle of them transitioning to the process of crossing over, we have now left the beginning of the book of Joshua. Where in the beginning of the book of Joshua, God speaks to him and says, Moses, my servant is dead. I was blown away when Dr. Bernice King had said on this weekend, and I saw it on her Twitter feed, and she had shared some things, and it stirred my heart as well. Uh, and she said, what do we do? When our elders become our ancestors. Mm. When the ones that once gave voice and wisdom to our lives are no longer with us on the journey. Notice what happens. In the beginning of Joshua chapter number one, God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now arise. And do what? You now have to move forward with where you are. So you are to mourn, but you can't stay there. You have to mourn Moses, but you have to move with Joshua. Mm. So we have to mourn, but move. Wow. Notice now, then they get over in chapter 3. And they're commanded to cross over the Jordan. Jordan means to descend. It's a low place. Same place where Jesus is baptized. Stay with me. It is in that place that God begins to do a new work. This is not the Red Sea. Last year I preached a message, this is not that. God was going to do something different. They were going to cross the Jordan this time, but it wouldn't be like the Red Sea. This time the priests would have to lead the way as they're carrying the ark and they would have to get their foot a little dirty before they crossed over. And just as they're beginning to do so, and they get across after the dry patches are there, after the water begins to dissipate, the Bible says in chapter 4, God looks over at Joshua and says, Go and get one from every tribe of the children of Israel. And have them gather these stones. And when they gather these stones, they will put them in this particular place. They are around an area that we now know of as Gilgal. Gilgal is a prophetic breeding ground. It is at Gilgal that we will see later on in the story in the book of Kings. How God will begin journeys of his own voices before Elijah even himself begins to ascend up before God he has to return back around Gilgal and around the Jordan River I wish you were hearing what I'm saying this morning it is in this particular place that God says gather these stones and you're gathering these stones so that when the day comes and your children rise up and they ask you what do these stones mean you'll be able to share with them what God has done? So I'm doing this out of remembrance. But this remembrance is to disrupt something. It's to remind you of the faithfulness of God so that when you get in trouble, you won't forget that God will be with you. What we must understand in this moment, while we're seeing major transitions, while we're seeing tremendous loss everywhere, is that the same God that was with us before is with us now. And what we need now is not an encore or a repeat performance, but we need to trust in the same God. Amen. To cause us to cross over. Says, get the stone. 
stones. Get the stones, each stone. Each stone. It's indicative. The children of Israel. As I was studying this, some of the Jewish rabbis had argued that it wasn't 12 stones. But that as each of the 12 tribes put a stone out, Joshua himself had placed stones himself. So many of the Jewish scholars and rabbinical scholars would say that there were really 24 stones. Mm. One for each tribe, but also one that Joshua laid himself. And I thought about how this is a picture of a new covenant principle. Wow. Because the stones that the tribes laid out was indicative of the 12 mm. tribes of Israel. But when Joshua, Joshua, Yehoshua, Yahweh is salvation, a picture of Christ, mm. picks out his own 12 stones. Yes. It's a picture of the 12 disciples wow. being laid and centered around him, which is a picture of the government of the church. 12 is a number of government. I wish you would hear me by revelation. 12 is a number of government. And as he's restructuring the government around Gilgal, Gilgal means cycle. Gilgal means to circle. Gilgal means circulation. Is it possible in this moment that we are living in that we're seeing all of these transitions as God begins to recycle the government of the church? Notice what happens. As he begins to lay the stones, they were given a specific instruction. Gather them as a memorial. But don't allow this memorial to make you a monument. Mm. Yes. Hear me. Gather them. Appreciate them. But you still got to make a move. There is still work to be done. So much so that the Bible says after this happens, then God begins to exalt Joshua in front of the people. And then they see that God was with him as he was with Moses. I, I want to argue this morning that it might have been tougher for them to understand that God was with them because they were so conditioned to how Moses did things. But God specifically said, as I was with him, so I will be with you. Not as I was in him. Because I'm going to be in you cognitively, spiritually, uniquely than I was with him before. So I can't look for the same thing. But I have to be able to receive the spirit of it by the spirit of God. So, fresh wind. These stones are markers. But the movement must continue. I have to mourn, but I also have to move. So we see in this text faith. We see the stones as foundation. But we also see Joshua as a picture of the future. Now I want to, I want to, I want to wrestle with this. It was not the Father who said that preaching is a form of public protest. I want to wrestle with this. Notice, notice 1 Kings chapter 22. I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. I hope this is making sense. I'm, yes, it I'm is. Spared, standing in here out of obedience to God. 1 Kings chapter 22. Notice something here. I'm only going to use a piece of it to extract the principle. I can't touch all of it now. Jehoshaphat is the king. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. Ahab, a wicked one, the king of Israel. The kingdom has now been split out of disobedience. <laughs> and what I've discovered is that whenever the people disobey and rebel, God sends them a leader that pictures their disobedience. Woo! Better hear what I'm saying. So it's wow. possible that we're being led right now. Wow. Out of our disobedience. It is in that moment, king comes to Jehoshaphat and says, I am as you are. Your people as your people, your horses as my horses. 
And he was ready to go to war. But Jehoshaphat said, wait a minute. Before we make a move, let's not strike emotionally. Let's not move until we've heard from God. Yes. And I came to tell somebody this morning, I feel the Holy Ghost. Go ahead. I came to tell somebody this morning, before you bust the move, before you do anything, before you do all of this stuff, and I know we have CDC guidelines, and I know we have all this kind of stuff, but you got to make sure before you move that you have heard from God. Mm. Ahab was ready to go because he had no desire to please God. He had a desire to serve himself. It's a picture, my present truth is a picture of where we are in our society and our culture today. Our narcissistic culture today in which everything exists for the pleasing of the self. But Jehoshaphat said, no, hold it. I'm closing with this, hold it. Inquire of the Lord. And he said something I love. He said, is there not a word from the Lord? Is there not a prophet? Is there not one that will tell us the truth? Not what we want to hear, itching ears. My Lord. Mm. Not here to entertain us. I was telling my barber, we were talking yesterday. Barber is a believer, we were talking yesterday. And he said, he said, I got too many yokes I deal with as a barber to come to church and be entertained. When I come to the house of God, I need to hear a word. I said, you better stop before I jump out this seat. <laughs> because he understood something that many of us don't understand. What we hear today, a lot of it is entertaining. But it has no substance from the word. He said, I don't want to hear something that makes me feel good because this is what I want to do. I want to make sure that what I do is aligned with the will of God. Because if it is not aligned with the will of God, it will not work. There's a little line in the book of Acts that says, a uh, good value stood up and stood before the council. The Bible says in the book of Acts that he stood up and said, if this be of God, it will show itself. But if it not be of God, it will surely fail. I've lived by that principle my entire life. I don't care if it's something that someone does that you agree with, something that someone does you don't agree with. If it is of God, it will stand. If it is not of God, it will fall. Mm. And, and so you've got to understand that we have to move beyond our limited, sensual, emotional perception to begin to walk and live by the Spirit of God. I hope you hear what I'm saying this morning. And notice, Jehoshaphat says, we need a word. And I came to tell you this morning, we need a word. Not one that will make us just feel good, but one that provokes us to change and transformation. The Bible says, he looks up and he says, go up. And so the king gathered his prophets. His prophets were for prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. And because his prophets were for prophet, mm. they told the king what they wanted to hear. But the king did not need what he wanted to hear. He needed to know the truth of the word of God. And I've got a question for the body of Christ. Will we, as the people of God, stand up and stand out for righteousness. Whether well, people want to hear about it or not. I'm not talking about being politically correct. I'm talking about being prophetically attuned to the Spirit of Almighty God. I'm almost finished, almost out of time. Notice, stay with me. Last thing. He says, there's still one man named Micaiah. I wish I had. There's still one man named Micaiah. How am I doing? There's still one man named Micaiah. He said, uh, the king said, but I hate him. Because he never tells me anything that's good. And I was praying about that because what the Lord was showing me is that is that, that lone ranger, that, that one prophet that was willing to stand up is exactly where we are needed in this hour and this moment. 400 were saying what was good. They were popular. Wrote a book, my first book was called Popularity. It's not enough. I'm in the process now of getting ready to re-release it. They were popular, but there was only one 
that really heard from God. They went over to Micaiah, 1 Kings 22, and the Bible says when they went over to Micaiah, they asked him the question, shall we go up? And he said, yeah, go ahead. The reason why is because he knew that's what they wanted to do anyway. But Jehoshaphat was inquiring by the Spirit of God. He said, no, don't tell us that. What is God really saying? Don't tell us what we want to hear. What is God really saying? And he said, if you go now, you'll be destroyed. And then he goes further and says in the same chapter that your prophets have a lying spirit in their mouth. Mm. Wow. You better hear what I'm saying by the Spirit of God. And, and he said, therefore, they're going to be the ones that lead you to destruction. And what, I, what I'm saying to us this morning, if we don't understand that in this moment, we have to steward it wisely to mourn what has come before us, but to move according to the Spirit of God to what's coming ahead of us. If not, we will be deceived by lying tongues, lying spirits that seek to say things that God never said, but they'll do it to entice you because it feels good. Lord have mercy. Mm. Said, what you've heard, they're saying it's from God, but it's not from me. And I want to challenge you this morning. This is a clarion call for discernment. To understand what God is requiring and calling of us. Says, says to them, you need to make sure that you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I want to challenge you. I call your spirit under arrest. I want to challenge you this morning to make sure before you make a move, and it's what God wants you to do. They were so bent on making moves that they hadn't even thought to consult God. Wow. And if we don't consult the Spirit of God, we'll be moving, but it won't be making a difference. And I want you to know this morning, this is a sobering word. I didn't come this morning to shout you, to light you up and all that. I came this morning by the Spirit of Almighty God to tell you that in this hour, we need to be a prophetic people who inspire the Spirit of God to others to believe in the midst of the chaos, to believe in the midst of the calamity, to believe in the midst of the darkness that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that we could ever ask or think. I know what the newscaster said. I know what others said. But I want you to know what God said. And God is saying to us, don't forget the stones. Don't forget what I've done. Because if you forget what I've done, you'll repeat unnecessary lessons. My Lord. I close with the question. In the text in the book of Joshua, when the children come and they ask, what do these stones mean? You will tell them that it was the Lord that brought us out. How do we honor the legacy of elders that transition to ancestors? By telling generations to come that it was the Lord that brought us out. Don't forget God. Amen. Don't forget God. Don't forget God. I'm not talking about living off of God, off of your grandma's prayers and your daddy and mama's prayers. I'm talking about you having a relationship with God for yourself. Amen. Knowing Him. Growing with Him. And being with Him. A sense of turning my spirit. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Head bowed, every eye closed. Yes, we have the phone there. Keep the phone in your hand. Keep it however you're looking. But hear me by the Spirit of Almighty God. Father, in Jesus' name, we surrender our lives to you. Give us, make us sober minded to know what you've called.